Okay, this next one here is from Cladu. Hopefully I'm saying your name right. Let me know if I need to pronounce it a different way. Since the summer, I started to gradually uh, drop into the I am state outside of meditation more and more. But in the last month, the state got stronger and the jaw tends to open. My eyes tend to also roll back and I start to hear some loud muffled white wind noise with a big pressure in my third eye. It feels like I'm about to have the greatest orgasm of my life and I start to lean in into the noise and this gets stronger and starts to be intermittent. intermittent. So to a point where it seems like I'm losing the awareness and when I try to stabilize with the I am, it disappears. My question is, how can I lean into that state more and let it express itself completely? Yeah, it sounds kind of like an astral projection or something, <laughs> or like a kundalini activation, maybe. Um, so the I am state is not an experience or an event. Um, reading your description of the jaw opening, the eyes rolling back, and the, the loud wind noise, that, that classically was always what happened when I used to do astral projection before exiting the body was that exact experience. So you're definitely having some kind of experience there, but that experience is not the I am state. The I am state is not like an event uh, of uh, a light show or a series of uh, sensations. The I am state, at least the way that I teach it, is mind heart coherence. When the mind finally drops into the intelligence and the intuition of the heart and your sense of self your state of being resides there. And so that sounds, you know, esoteric. What does that really mean? What is that actually like? The way that I like to describe it as it, as it, I experience it is that it is a fearless and desireless state of being because in the I am state, you are in contact with your eternal nature. So you're not afraid of death. You're not afraid of anything that could happen to the body because it's the I am state, not the I am a body state. So fear cannot be there if you know you're not the body. And then it's also desireless because only a separate self can want something, can want an object, can want an outcome. So if you have any fears or any desires for external things showing up, then you know for sure you're not in the I am state. <clears throat> but really, you're always the I am. It's not about you becoming the I am or something when you enter that state. It's a state of awareness is all it is. It doesn't change what's true about you. You know, you're always that. But the mind will fight you vehemently to keep your sense of self abiding as a body, as a separate individual. And so the personal sense sort of dies a long, slow, cruel, agonizing death as we meditate on the I am. This was Nisargadatta's practice, right? Um, remember I am always, be the I am, meditate on the I am. And as you do that, the, the separate self will begin to fight for its survival and begin to maybe argue with you or trigger things to come up to distract you from that state. So the I am state will bring out anything in the system. You know, we'll have to come up to fight it and uh, just like an animal in the wild would fight for its survival. The ego is very much an animalistic mechanism in the mind. So it behaves like an animal would in that sense. So to be in the I am state is to practice the I am state. And in uh, the video I did in the spiritual intelligence series, I gave a couple of like easy practices to um, help you enter mind heart coherence quickly when you are aware that you're out of that state. Like if, if there's a lot of anxiety building up and you want to relax through that state and into the I am, uh, one thing you can do is put your hand on your heart and close your eyes. And just sit in stillness like that. And secondly, what you can do is Think of anything at all that you are grateful for or you have love for because that will activate the heart chakra. And then you can just kind of slip down into that sensation of love or gratitude 
and say, ah, yes, that's right, I am. I am has no problems. I am is eternal. You know, we talk about this a lot on these calls, but I and am is the existence and consciousness. Really, it's consciousness and existence, right? I, consciousness, am, existence. So one way to annihilate those thoughts that would take you out of I am is to weigh and measure them against the facts of your being, of existence and consciousness. So is consciousness itself anxious or is anxiety and appearance in consciousness? Really ask, right? Really ask that question and look at it with curiosity. You know, we make progress by the level of genuineness and authenticity of our inquiry. Like, do you really want to know? Or are you just doing it to try and get a quick result? That makes all the difference in inquiry. Keep tracing back your sense of self. Keep tracing back your being until you find it in the incorruptible, permanent self that you really are, the I am. You know, my mind is appearing as anxious, upset, worried, whatever. But what's behind the mind? Because obviously there's something behind the mind. You know, there's everything has to have a source, an origin point. What is giving the mind power to exist and have thought and reason? Well, it's something earlier than the mind. Let's just call it consciousness. Then there's just the substratum of consciousness. And everything in the mind is an appearance on that screen of consciousness. Everything in the mind is written on the chalkboard of consciousness. And what, what gets written gets erased quickly, right? It doesn't stay very long. So consciousness is the real and the mind is the transient, the, the appearance, right? And then what's consciousness being supported by? What's prior to consciousness, as Nisargadatta would say? And we don't have a name for it. We don't have anything we can say about it. There's no objective qualities. We refer to it only as the absolute, you know, the, the most original origin of all that is, uh, the very heart of God itself, the absolute, everything else appears inside that great substratum of the absolute. So it's like, if I can find a mind in myself, well, the mind goes back to consciousness, consciousness goes back to the absolute. So all I am is the absolute, right? Just like, you know, um, the tentacle of an octopus all that tentacle is, is the octopus. You know, yeah, it may go out and stick its tentacle on something, but all that, that suction cup is, all the tentacle is, all, everything is just the octopus, right? In that same way, if I can say that consciousness is happening here, well, then I am the absolute. I am. That's what I am. That's where I am should take you, is to the most original point that you can find within yourself. We can do the same thing with existence, right? Does existence itself have a problem here? I mean, definitely not, right? Because there's been billions and billions of human beings on this planet who've all had millions of problems in the course of their life. And has any of those problems even touched or altered existence itself? You go, nope, not at all. So existence is the real. And problems are the unreal, the, the writing on the chalkboard. So is existence happening here? Do I exist? If yes, flow chart, I am. I am the absolute. There, there's no other option, right? Because everything has to have a source. Nothing can exist that doesn't have a source. So again, self-inquiry is the art of tracing myself back to my source and abiding there. That's the I am state. So we may do that in practice in day-to-day -day life. And then quickly the mind gets busy and says, oh, no, no, you're not going to be in the I am right now. You're going to be in anxiety right now. And so you just have to work through that and go back to the I am. But this, this source of what we are, this I am principle in us has so much gravity to it that it will begin to, like a black hole, just absorb everything in its path. You know, a black hole doesn't care. What, what is coming into it. All of it gets destroyed and turned into that dark matter and gets absorbed into the black hole. I am is like that. It, it transcends everything. It's prior to everything. It's unaffected by everything. 
And so more and more as you abide as that every day, as you're washing the dishes, as you're at the grocery store, you know, abide in the awareness of oneness, abide in the I am. More and more you feel the incredible, you know, unbreakable peace and groundedness that's there. It's like it becomes your safe haven, your, uh, your interior castle, as St. Teresa called it. And once you find a home like that, you don't want to leave it anymore. You know, once you find a, a well that never runs dry, why are you going to go search for another well? You know, once you find infinite supply, are you worried about what your neighbor has down the street? That's the I am. That's what it does to consciousness over time to the, the individual consciousness, let's say, is that it crystallizes it and, and gradually pulls it in to that great gravity of our being that there's no problems here. There's no lack here. There's no separation here. There's no fear here. So it's a really great place to hang out. So can, uh, you know, these fantastic experiences you're talking about of body orgasms and eyes rolling back, can that happen in the I am state? For sure. Is that the I am state itself? No. The I am state's not an experience. There's no event we can point to to say, oh, this thing happened, and that's how I knew I was in the I am state. It's a state of being that is eternal, right? It's, it's always what we are. We just become aware of it or not. And when we're aware of it, it feels like that mind-heart coherence, that fearless, desireless state of being that can't be touched.